Double Forever. This is a fun movie. Kamen Rider Double Forever, A to Z, The Gaia Memory of Fate, and thus why I just prefer to use the shortened title for a bunch of these, debuted as the series' story was entering its endgame. And unlike some of the other Heisei Kamen Rider movies I've covered, it is 100% canonical. At no point does it contradict continuity of Double's story, slotting perfectly between episodes 44 and 45 in the series. And the series itself acknowledges its events at the beginning of episode 45. Alongside its final arcs tying into elements both set up for this movie, and then following up on them. In the background of the Foundation X subplot, Jun Kazu had regularly been seen carrying a metal case which contains a set of 26 blue-tipped refined Gaia memories. These, Type 2 Gaia memories, were developed from museum's research data by Foundation X for their own plans. The unspoken sentiment behind them to ultimately double-cross their research partner once they are no longer of use and tie up the outstanding loose end. At the end of episode 44, these memories were turned over to one of June's subordinates for delivery to their main headquarters. Which is directly where this film picks up. With a man jumping out of the transport helicopter from a cargo plane, the man immediately shot for his troubles. My god! Museum precipitated the undead apocalypse! He can only be a... The man, Katsumi Daido, played by singer Mitsuru Matsuoka, and dear god that a lot of musicians make it into this entry, steals one of them, revealing... a lost driver. Yeah, we'll swing back to that. The helicopter explodes, scattering the remaining 25 memories across Futo, Katsumi meeting with his teammates, and telling them to have fun tracking down theirs. Yeah, that's a bit excessive to say. I mean, it's not like one's going to fall into the hands of anyone we know. Oh, this will not end well. With Shotaro, he is battling a new hole in his ceiling, dripping rain into his case files, as Akiko busies herself on preparing for a date with Ryu, which will take them to the Futo Tower. <laughs> Philip, on the other hand, is out on his own, at this point having learned the identity of his mother, Shroud, and now having come to question what life with his family might have been like, had things not led to them all being corrupted by the influence of Gaia memories. But speaking of memories, this is when the mass outbreak of Dopants begins, the lot of them the group encounter, all people forcibly possessed by the TU2 memories seeking compatible users as a safety feature. Thus, it's time to kick into high gear! No, oh, right, forgot to mention, this was directed by Koichi Sakamoto, so of course we'd have to have the bike leaping kick. Though speaking of this movie's direction, while the choreography is excellent, the slow motion to this bike jump kick is to infer its power and badassness, the camera work for several scenes is... crap. I have no idea who the cinematographer was, or if it was an issue with the camera itself, but with them moving the camera to either stay at pace with the action, or shaking it to add more excitement and realism to the frenaticness of the brawls, it actually achieves the opposite, blurring the effects so those of us following it can no longer see it play out. A major detraction, as what makes Sakamoto's stunt work so good, is the flowing narrative showcased from second to second. The fluid movements of the suit actors all weaving together in a culminative climax that is severely hampered if you're only allowed to see them as indistinct blurs. Sakamoto's direction is not the problem, it's to his usual standards but the camera isn't properly capturing it. Like my only guess to why is the frame rate isn't high enough to capture the details, or it needed a steadier hand operating it. As with exception to the Double Returns movies that Sakamoto also directed, which also have this issue, this, as far as I can remember, is not a problem at all with any other directorial work Sakamoto has ever done. Not even Travelers had this issue, and it's only really a problem with scenes in which you're supposed to be keeping pace with a rapid series of actions. Which means pretty much every scene involving Axel. Speaking of Ryu, he finds some familiar faces. <laughs> he probably took a left at Albuquerque. But because these Dopants are possessed humans, none of them are fighting as effectively as their test subject counterparts, meaning the group can 
pretty easily take care of them. But upon ejection, the memories do not break. And more confounding, in Double's fight with T2 violence, another Dopan appeared, and saved a mother and child from danger with their power. One's based on wind. The possessed users turn out to be their friends, who'd found the T2s and were bringing them to them, with exposition on them carried out by a woman who helped Philip a bit earlier in the Dopan attack, who introduces herself as International Investigations Officer Maria S. Cranberry. She requests their help in retrieving the memories in order to keep them out of Katsumi's hands, her also explaining about him and his mercenary force. Never. Never is short for Necro Over, though I will refer to Never as the organization and Necro Over as those afflicted with the condition. They are, well, zombies. He was put through augmentation experiments which renders them effectively immortal, with some consequences to that which are only really exposited on in Double Returns Eternal that retroactively then makes their plan for this movie utterly stupid. I'll explain when we get to Double Returns Eternal. But Necro-Overs are faster and stronger than normal humans, and invulnerable to normal means of injuring someone. So, with them further augmented by Gaia memories... <laughs> Philip, however, with how he met Maria, begins to become fixated on the idea that she might actually be Shroud without... Well, her shroud of bandages, Shotaro noting his partner's fixation. With the exposition delivered, the group begins to use their contacts and friends to hunt down the T2s as they pop up, Phil in turn coming across a music box Maria left, and using it to track her down and return it, only to get assaulted. I need an adult. I am an adult! She calms down, revealing the box was her son's, all she had to remind her of who he was. As Queen Elizabeth turn over three more memories, Shatar is confronted by one of the Never Agents, Reika, who engages him in a brawl. Ooh, she didn't like that at all. For she is... This leads to a motorcycle chase, which is... Interrupted by another of Reiko's cohorts. Genki Sudo? <laughs> Genki Sudo is the Ludo Dopant? But that's too fluid for him! He leads an army of robot men! I have been waiting six years and nearly 300 episodes to make that joke. And thus, another small skirmish keeping Devil from thwarting Never's goal of collecting the memories. Up, <laughs> oh, you missed. And worse, it's shown that yes, all of the Never agents are using T2 memories based on Doubles, both the Trigger and Metal Dopants making themselves known, which collectively overwhelmed Double until they're saved by the appearing Cyclone Dopont. They retreat, Philip looking up the expanded details in the Necro-Overs Marie didn't tell them. They were originally a super soldier project funded by Foundation X, which lost its cash flow when Museum's Guy memory research resulted in far more powerful agents without the preparation time of taking a corpse and turning it invincible. While on an individual level Necro-Overs are undying, thus is a valuable process, for disposable field agents and with the variety of powers Guy Memories can grant, it's easy to see why they went with one over the other when Necroverse hit a developmental wall that only ends up revealed in Double Returns Eternal. Nonetheless, that factors into their scheme as Never invades the Futo Tower and takes it over. Game over. No, 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 no. That only ensures your later death through irony. <laughs> They scare everyone out of the tower to secure it, Maria contacting Team Narumi to bring the Gaia memories they've collected in order to get them out of the city, only for it all to be a trap. The group meeting Katsumi, 
who greets Philip openly as a brother. Shotaro refutes the idea that his partner is anything like him, especially with everything Philip has done over the series to make up for his sins. But, since he's here... Oh, now they're pissed. Why do so many of Toy's writers not fucking get this? Philip insists on dealing with this personally, Fang Joker gauging Eternal, but continually fails against Katsumi's Tactics Level 2. And Axel is prevented from assisting by Trigger. Game start. I can see where XI would later come to mind their catchphrases. Both riders are overwhelmed, but before they can regroup by switching things up to extreme, Eternal reveals its own trump card. Yes, Eternal can short out the power of any lesser Gaia memory, leaving the Futo riders powerless. And to add insult to injury, Maria reveals herself as helping them. Though surprisingly, she tries to talk Katsumi down from killing them, buying Akiko, of all people, the time to call in the Revolgary to evacuate all of them. Nice one, boss lady! <laughs> The blaze surround Futo Tower in at the very least a token attempt to block in Never's attempts at terrorism, but inside the tower, the group already have everything they need, several shown injecting themselves with a serum that apparently maintains their bodies. Really, with its use in this movie, it could have been anything from a stimulant to an alternative for food. A again to get into when we touch on Double Returns Eternal when we're actually told what it is. The memories are taken stock of, and of the 26 they need, only one is missing. Thus, they decide to let Futo's citizens find it for them in a citywide broadcast, Eternal introducing himself by proclaiming he is their savior. And people wonder why this is a contender for Best Rider series. Katsumi reveals that Futo Tower is being turned into a weapon, one designed to turn the entire city into a paradise of the undead, and the one who brings them the last memory... will get one billion yen! For as time and again it has been shown, greed will almost always supersede one's own preservation instincts. I mean, he just said he was going to kill everyone in the city! city in a party time. Thus, Team Rider knows what they need to do to not only prevent the Never Apocalypse, but fight back as the T2s haven't been disabled by Eternal's power. If only they weren't fighting their own city to get it. However, with the scenes from earlier and his justification, Philip thinks they might be able to go to Maria and talk her down, as there had to have been a reason she came to them. But none of them agree, thinking his view compromised, as he thinks she's Shroud. Why does Knife <laughs> And the only ones that do know are his enemies. Much like Begin's Night was character exploration for Shotaro, this time it's for Philip. As now that he knows almost everything about himself that he lost, he has come to question what he's even doing anymore. He has all the answers, but doesn't remember a thing about himself, who he really was. Was he truly the monster Shotaro found him as before his memories were wiped away by Saiko's machinations? Or was he the kind boy Maria reminisced about that loved that music box? He's become fixated on her, not because she might be Shroud, but due to him hungering for that familial connection more and more now that he knows who his actual family was. And unfortunately, as stunted emotionally as he is thanks to his memory loss, that desperate wish for more than the bonds he's made with Shotaro, Akiko, and the others has left him open to be manipulated. And sometimes it 
takes making a bad choice to realize what you really have and who you really are. With Museum, Wakana and company find all of their memories have also been rendered inert. We would be realizing this inevitability of a double cross too late, as he also muses on why Futo Tower was chosen. It's a power generation facility. Pull up in there, and whatever power they need will come in on its own with the wind. Psycho likewise receiving a cameo as she walks amid the chaos Katumi has caused in the sudden rush to find and turn over Guy memories for the reward. The idiocy of humanity showcased in selling out their own. All while Shotaro returns home. Morose, and not knowing what to do. And who should appear in answer, but... Well, son? Delusion or spirit is debatable at this point. Sokichi points to Philip's book, Shotaro taking this to mean he shouldn't give up on his partner just because of his wish to not be alone in the world after everything he's relearned. And as he vanishes, he leaves behind... a gift. Yeah, this was at the point the movie overstepped itself and serves as a minor plot hole. Where the hell did that lost driver come from? My personal interpretation, thanks to the release of the novel, The One Who Continues After Z, is this is the lost driver Shroud gave Philip during its events, since they are canon to double overall. With the driver just left out for some reason, since before this they were going back over stored case files due to the leak, and Shotaro's momentary delusion of Sokichi just superseding his perspective of reality. It would have been better, however, had it not been left in the open like that, instead pulled out of a drawer or secret hiding place as if forgotten, which Sokichi points him to, which would more fully gel with the novel and the greater series canon about this lost driver. Or hell, maybe had Philip building it as a backup double driver and only partially completing it. They had a few options, especially since this was not meant to infer that Sokichi's alive and just been an asshole about coming back. But the reality is they likely just wrote themselves into a corner with this. But with how the series features dead people, the Earth as a living entity, and the possessed puppet spirit, this is not entirely out of the range of imagination. It's just a frustrating, the hell was that, kind of scene. And it is frustrating, as the next development in the film kind of hinges on it. Vareka has found him, and is in the mood for a rematch. Philip, however, has found from clues Maria's location, a concert hall, where her son once performed. But her son was not Philip. She is not Fumine Sonozaki. She is Maria Daido, Katsumi's mother. And yes, the musician thing is all kinds of meta, since Katsumi's played by Mitsuru Matsuoka. Maria is in fact the creator of the Necro Over Process, Katsumi its first test subject, because she watched him die, and was desperate to bring him back, taking Foundation X's money in order to do so. But there were strings, which helped make Katsumi into the man he is now. This is another trap. Maria manipulated him from the beginning, because they need Philip for their plan. Sho and Reika's brawl wrecks the office, in the scuffle Shotaro remembering the hole in the ceiling, and realizing that with the T2 searching their most compatible user, that he was already sent their key to victory. This cinches it. Heat survives, but Reika, not so much. Philip is jacked into a device Maria constructed in the tower, it called the X-Picker. Kitsumi planning to use him as a processor for utilizing the memory data in his mass conversion of the city into Necro-Overs, tearing him down as he once again compares them to monsters. <laughs> Shotaro and Ryu assault the tower, Luna's illusion powers supplying disposable minions to try and block them, though T2 Joker just decimates them. While Ryu has put on enough muscle to not have great difficulty lifting the engine blade's massive weight, which helps him against Trigger, all the while Shotaro then gets into a brawl with the metal dopant. <laughs> Joker! 
God damn, these guys are disposable. I mean, in the movie, there's Persona to them, but in recap, not much to go on. More there, as it seemed like they needed a larger number of relevant people for Katsumi's mercenary force, and to match the number of memories double used to have a counter force of antagonists. But as the battle goes on, Philip finally has it out with Maria. Shotaro is almost always right, and with good reason. Unlike other toy protagonists I can name who are right in spite of what reality tells us. This is where Joker punches his way in and has it out with Eternal, demanding to know what their plan was. But even then, he's still outclassed by Katsumi's greater synchronicity with the Eternal memory and Eternal having backups. Ooh, piercing damage. And now, with the last one in hand, he uses Zone to recall all of them. Wait, couldn't you have just done that earlier? Or did you need to know where they all were for that to work? They're all plugged into the x becker the weapon charging, with Kitsumi announcing to the town their fate. <laughs> However, Necroovers are not immortal, Reika stumbling in with her body falling apart. Apparently, if you hit them hard enough with Dopon powers, or in the Refined Memories case Maximum Drives, that much simultaneous trauma from an abnormal method, as Gaia memory damage cannot be healed by normal means as was set up in the show before this, is enough damage in the Necroovers case to cause catastrophic collapse of their bodies. Katsumi showing no care for his comrades as anything other than pawns. As why Katsumi's done this, more than as revenge against Foundation X, what he really wants is what Philip wants, their desires reflecting in each other's like a mirror, darkly. He doesn't want to be alone. Again, something made stupid by the events of Double Returns Eternal. Yeah, you kinda fucked up on this one. I mean, what did you expect? You put the man with the entire repository of human knowledge and creator of Gaia memories in that thing as a means to control your little transformation wave, and assumed he wouldn't figure out a way to break it? And not only that, with the direct connection to the T2 memories and quick look up when you patched him into the Gaia library, he figured out a way to make Eternity last only a moment. His one advantage over them is gone, just as Maria wakes up. <laughs> Maria Dido, attempting to save her son, turned him into a monster. But from interaction with Philip, she finally realized the truth of what she's done. And at the end... <laughs> ...did her part to make up for it. Axel Bell's trigger once again, and this time turning the tables on the sniper, as Katsumi escapes with Eternal and Zone, intent on triggering his own personal guy impact manually, only to be blocked by Shotaro and Philip before he can climb the tower. And thus, Philip completes his character arc. He knows who he is. Alongside his partner, he is... The two-in-one Kamen Rider! Luno, however, drags him away... into an early bird cameo. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Yes, for the... Technically, second time in my review since I did Superhero Tyson years ago. Let us meet Eiji Hino, a passing through common rider. Hey, 
And yes, this cameo was canon, occurring between Oz's fourth and fifth episodes, and it is called back to later, several times. In fact, Oz being active beginning around this point factors into the motivations and character actions of Devil's final arc. Regardless, he's the one that takes care of Luna for Devil. As Devil just rams straight into Eternal, and fluently and effortlessly countering him by flying through all nine of his base form combinations. This is literally the best scene in the movie, and is the ultimate culmination of the versatility of Devil's power set. But even as they wrap it with Extreme, Eternal can still advance himself further. His neck over body and compatibility with Eternal, allowing him to do what no other writer can. And with this, everyone prays for a miracle. And here's where I have to bring up one other detail that's overlooked with this series. The city of Futo. While I skipped over it too, I can't underweigh how much the character of the city of Futo is expressed throughout the series, personifying it as a living being through the noir narration in a way that's never been done in any other series. Even the villains recognize the character of the city and its aesthetic in this series. And while many write it off as a quirk of the series, it's all a culminative factor climaxing in this film. For as everyone prays for Double to save them from this calamity, the spirit of the city itself joins in with them. Even if its helping hand comes from simply sending a bit of wind back their way. Behold, the ultimate evolution of Double. It's really, really tacky. I like the wings, not so much the crystal server shade of gold. Double Extreme's color palette really did not work with gold. I think a more shining prismatic light would have been better. Nonetheless, this is their final trump. The T2 memories are all destroyed, thwarting whatever plan Foundation X had for them, but the town has been left scarred by this day, and this will only drive Team Narumi's motivations in the following weeks, to close the case on the Dopant crime wave for good. But at least in the interim, they've all survived, and they have each other. Double Forever is arguably the best Kamen Rider movie. I mean, it's not like it has a lot of competition on that, considering the state of many of them, but its story is insanely strong and works without you knowing a thing about the show, so it's extremely accessible. And even then, the setup details tying into it from the show only accents and not overrides what's presented in the movie. The stunt choreography, fantastic, if albeit possessing far too much shaky cam in its presentation, as I said earlier. The characters are all on point and explores aspects of them not allowed to be presented thus far, which does have an impact on them, and do all follow from their ongoing arcs within the series, alongside being called back to within the series proper. While the shipping of Ryu and Akiko has been teased more and more strongly since Isaka's defeat, this is the event which confirms they are in a relationship and the pair want it to be serious. A detail I didn't touch on much to save time. This is the event that addresses and explores Philip's wish to get his family back after at long last he knows who all of them are, and his lamentation that he'll never know nor remember them as they were, before they were all poisoned by the power of Gaia memories. This is the event that has Shotaro stand at his own for the first time to be the big damn hero. When the chips were down, he was the only one left to save the day, just as his mentor Sokichi was for years. And he more than steps up to achieve that victory. And this is the film that unequivocally refutes the idea that common Riders, true common Riders, are monsters first and foremost, after the franchise had suffered nearly a full decade under that twisted, poison perception, condemning and lambasting that idea with a man that no one, absolutely no one, dignifies or respects for the actions he's committing as worthy or deserving of such a title and by doing so once more reaffirming the core ideology lost from the Showa years because it was thought archaic. 
The biggest problem with it, however, all comes down to continuity errors. Not story continuity errors, as there is not a single one in this movie. I'm serious, and that's again part of what makes this movie so good. It's one of the few films ever made by Toei to in absolutely no way contradict the series it ties into, and something they have been trying and failing to recreate ever since. But even Eiji Hino's early bird cameo can be easily explained without contradiction to Oz's canon, as all he does is use powers and abilities he has in his possession between episodes 2 and 4 in his show, which is more than enough of an understandable overlap between them. No, what I'm referring to is effect and filming continuity errors. Katsumi's gunshots to kill Maria are all digital effects, and as a result, they never show the bloodstains or holes on her body as opposed to using squibs. The hole in the office roof is just a rainy spot earlier, then it's a full-on hole with the Joker memory buried in the ground. Double Extreme is missing his maximum slot in the final battle, Shotaro throwing Eiji the Taka core medal has it changed between a toy and a prop one between shots as they lost one, and likewise there's inconsistency in his slotting of medals. Actually, most of the effect continuity snafus relate to AG in part because O's series wasn't even filming its first episode yet, so they hadn't finalized a lot of minutia. And that's something that's popped up in nearly every Rider Early Bird cameo to date. But all of these are admittedly minor things you only note on rewatching, but I'm amazed they didn't catch a bunch of these, as Sakamoto's known for being more meticulous than that. But with this being Koichi Sakamoto's first big theatrical feature, and the rush to get everything in it done so they could close out the series, and with everything else being so good, it is ultimately all forgivable. Though yeah, both the Sokichi scene and the climax are not the strongest parts of them. One to even set off the final act, and the latter if you're not aware of the personification through the series of the town and the gales that constantly sweep over it, it can seem kind of deus ex machina -y but I feel is consistent with the franchise's original thematic of drawing power from the wind. It uses it a lot better than, say, Superhero Tyson Grand Prix, where the wind literally comes out of nowhere after being called, whereas this is a constant background detail that's existed in the series which validates it. Katsumi and his Never Team, however, would end up being so popular that they'd get their own spin-off film, but we'll get to that when we get to that, as I keep saying, as that event certainly weakens this film a lot in hindsight. But for what it is, with exclusion to anything else, Double Forever overall is a pretty solid feature. Now, if you came here after being linked to it in Part 6, please go back to that video as we close out the series. If you came here from elsewhere, prepare yourselves, as next up is Movie War Core. Goodie.